Hi everyone, welcome back to the Pro MMA Betting Podcast. So we're going to break down the card coming up this Saturday. Looks like there's going to be no more breaks for a while. I know we had three in eight days basically, but we didn't had last weekend off. Looks like we're going to be running all the way from the 30th of May until at least the end of June. But beginning of July is normally International Fight Week, so... I wonder if Dana's going to go old school and bang out three shows in a week like they used to do. So that would be interesting. But I think the schedule is going to be really heavy. It looks like the Contender Series is returning towards the end of, I think it was, well, end of June. I saw a fighter tweet saying that he was on the card. I can't remember the exact date now. But it looks like it's going to get really busy with UFCs every week and the Contender Series returning. I can't remember how long it runs for, the Contender Series, but I think it's normally a couple of months. So we're going to have lots and lots of cards to play. As always, we're just going to do a quick recap on how we got on on the last event of the the triple card that we had across a week, basically. On pre-bets, we ended up down one unit. The night basically hinged on the Barboza decision. We had a unit on Barboza. He didn't get the decision. Haven't re-watched it, but at the time I was very confident that Barboza was two rounds up because I even tipped Barboza on live bet at the end of round two. I think for a unit, he was minus 200 at the end of round two. I was really confident he was two rounds up. Um, I've not re-watched round three. I don't know if that round is controversial or not. I've seen a lot of people saying Barboza was that strike at him and Ego just got the takedown. But kind of whatever way you shake it, I thought he won the first two rounds. But it's part and parcel with the game. All you can do as a better is hope that those kind of verdicts even themselves out. So no point crying over it, moaning about it. It does hurt, but... You can just hope that you're going to nick a few that perhaps you shouldn't. And as I said, across the course of a year, you can just hope it evens itself out. But was a bit of a sickener losing that one, I've got to admit. And it, it cost me a, a, a winning night. Um, resulted in me having a losing night on pre-bets. Uh, so we lost the unit on pre-bets. And I actually had a losing night on live betting as well. I can't remember the last time I had a losing night on pre-bets and live betting. Live betting, again, we was unlucky. As I said, we we added a little bit to Barboza after round two. We took Baser a couple of minutes into round one. Could just see a big speed difference against Matt Brown. Matt Brown did give us a mini heart attack when he, he nearly put Baser out. But the reason I went for that live bet early was just the speed. You could just see that Matt Brown looked like he, his reflexes had, had gone and facing a guy... I think he's like 12 years younger, something crazy like that. You could just see a big speed difference immediately. And we also went in on Angela Hill after round, I think it was, was it round two or round one? I can't remember when we better, but we took her and another controversial decision. So this is the thing, you think we'd at least get the Hill decision to even at the Barbosa decision, but it was just one of them nights we didn't get the Hill decision either. Um, I thought round three was close. I haven't rewatched the fight. I wasn't as confident as I was with Barboza in terms of Hill getting that decision. I do need to rewatch round three because I do remember Gadella landing some big shots that might have swayed the judges. The problem with Angela Hill is she doesn't really have any impetus or impact on her strikes. And if even if you're out landing someone, if that person is landing bigger, more eye-catching shots, it will hold sway with the judges a lot of the time. And that's probably where the decision went against us. But I'd have to rewatch it. But Fair play to Claudia for even making it competitive, whether you think she won or not, because normally round three, she just melts, um, because it was a high-paced fight. Clearly lost round two. I didn't expect her to have much left in round three, but where she's not wrestling as much now, it seems to be helping her cardio, but flip side is she's getting dragged into closer fights. So, yeah, we lost about a unit on live betting as well, but... Across the three shows, we profited just under six units. So if you said to me, for every three shows, we're going to be up nearly six units, I'll take that all day long. Um, And we was very unlucky with that last show. That could have easily been a three out of three in terms of profit. So we move on to this card. Just to recap on the service, guys, you can sign up for a year. I'm currently running a deal at the moment, £150 for the year. Absolute bargain. You get full access to pre-betting. You get full access to live betting tips. I put out a podcast for every UFC show. Answer questions. We've got a private Discord channel for live betting. Members are always on there having a chat. There's really good camaraderie. 
come along and join the team 150 pounds for the year anyone as long as your um, unit size isn't peanuts you would have easily covered your membership and made some profit across the free events that we had over that one week period it's you're not going to find it the service cheaper anywhere else guys so 150 pounds you can't subscribe to the 150 pounds through the website so either drop me an email if you're interested info at pro mma betting.com or send me a dm on twitter at pro mma betting all of our bets are tracked guys there's free links below this video to our free trackers we post our bet slips on twitter full transparency and i don't cover up the stakes like everyone else does. well hardly anyone posts their slips for starters but people that do post their slips most of them cover up the stakes i show full transparency i use one thousand pound units i prove that i'm betting what i'm tipping i'm not one of these people that are asking for people's money and then they're not even proving that they're betting what they're tipping and if they are they're covering up their stakes i mean it's how can you ask for money and you're covering up why are you covering up your stakes what because you're betting five bucks a unit or maybe one dollar a unit is scandalous behavior so full transparency is there i will post all the bet slips i will prove that i'm betting what i'm tipping and i will post bet slips as well for stuff that i haven't tipped sometimes i get better lines um, at the moment i'm reduced to just using bet online for my betting in the uk the betting shops are still shut and matchbook which is an exchange in the uk well i think most of europe can use it as well they are currently banned in the uk as well i'm hoping that's going to be rectified it looks like it's just a compliance issue so but obviously with everything going on in the world it slowed down the process of getting it resolved but i think they will be back in the uk market well i hope they will be um, i've got betfair exchange as well but they're quite late releasing lines so by the time they release lines normally the lines are, are kind of set where they are and it can be a struggle to find value and the liquidity isn't as good at betfair exchange as it is at matchbook either so at the moment i'm just really reduced to bet online but they are releasing openers bet online and sometimes they're opening with quite wide limits so i'm able to actually get some good money down but by the time the lines get bet up the value's gone so i will post bets as well that i've made that aren't necessarily tips but i always identify that on twitter as to whether this has been a tip or just a personal play that i managed to get on at a good price that quickly evaporated so i couldn't tip it so i'm very transparent in that respect as well there's no tipping odds that just aren't available to anyone it's just there's no point i've got guys that can use certain sites you know everyone's different as to who they use there's no point me tipping a line to people that can that's only available on bet online when a lot of my members don't use bet online and a lot of them don't so i'm not, I'm not going to tip an opener from bet online it's not fair so there's full transparency there you won't find anyone more transparent as i said for the live betting tips we've got a private discord channel there's a lot of chatter that goes on amongst all the members we've, we've got about 150 members now so the chat is frozen during fights so no one can no one can add any communication all you will see during the fights is any tips if there is any tips given there's no other chatter clogging up the channel so you miss it and then i'll unfreeze the chat in the break between fights or sometimes during a fight when the odds are gone and there's no way i'm going to be offering a live bet i'll unfreeze it during the fight um it j just depends so sometimes when we get to like round three i'll unfreeze it but during fights completely frozen so you can see the live betting tips that come in um, I quote my odds based on Bet365, but you're free to use whoever you want. Lots and lots of books are offering live betting at the moment, guys, that haven't historically, like Bet Online, for instance, are currently offering live betting with big limits as well. Um, but there's a lot of other books as well that are currently offering it, offering it due to the lack of action. I hope it's going to continue once all sports are back. But there's a great chance to make some money on live betting at the moment. Especially, I know Americans have always had a problem with live betting. A lot of my members use Bet Phoenix, which does offer live betting regardless of current world circumstances but there's more books accessible to american bettors at the moment that can use live betting and as i say i hope it continues once once other sports reopen whether it does or not i don't know i guess it depends on how much money they're making from offering live betting on on mma so we shall see but yeah so just back to the memberships 150 pounds it's 25 percent discount for the year cheap as chips guys as long as your unit size isn't peanuts you'd you highly like to make that money back very quickly and and then some so last year 100 
unit, £100 per unit or $100 per unit betters made, 14500 across the year. Got a whole lot of shows to get stuck into. The last half of the year is going to be extremely busy, as I've already said, with the UFC Contender Series. Bellator, I think, is coming back in July. Cage Warriors is going to be back. And boxing hasn't even returned yet. So we've got boxing as well. So it's going to be really, really busy. So if you want to jump on, jump on while you can. This price isn't going to be around forever. Prices are going to be going up. So let me know through Twitter or send me an email, info at prommabetting.com. But we're going to jump into this card. As always, we're going to look start from the bottom, work our way through the card. Just a reminder, guys, This is uh, there's more of a betting focus on this podcast as opposed to a lot of the other podcasts where... People will just pick who they think wins. I don't necessarily pick who I think wins. I will pick where I think the value is. So don't always take my pick as gospel as in I think that fight is going to win. I go with the value. I go where I feel there is value on a particular line. So always bear that in mind when you are taking in my picks and whether you're thinking about adding a bet or not. There's no guarantee that X fighter is going to win. I mean, there never is. But we, we look at the value and assess from there. So we're going to start off the card with Chris Gutierrez taking on Vince Morales in the bantamweight division. Uh, just a quick look over the stats. We've got Vince Morales has three inch reach advantage here. Chris has a couple of inches in height on Morales. Significant strikes landed per minute. Chris is at about three and a half. Vince is just under five. Absorbed, Chris is uh, 2.3. Vince is getting up towards 4. Take downs, they're not going to come into play here, guys. I mean, Vince has never attempted a takedown. Chris Gutierrez, per 15 minutes, 0.38. I can't see him attempting a takedown here either. It's going to be a, this is going to be a stand-up fight. Uh, Vince Morales, I actually like Vince Morales. Now, I don't... I've not had much joy betting him though. I did bet him on the contender series against Pilate. It looked like he was going to win that fight. I had Pilate really badly hurt, but ended up getting taken down and submitted at the start of the second round. And I also bet him against Benito Lopez, and that was a bad decision. I mean, I rewatched it for the first time since it actually happened the other day when I was looking at this fight, and you know, there's. Even if you give round one to Benito, I still think Vince won two and three. You go to MMA decisions and I think there's 11 media outlets that have put in their card and it was literally 11-0 for Vince Morales. It was a bit of a head scratch of that decision. Um, so I lost on, on that bet as well. So could have easily been 2-0 but I'm and 2 betting him. Vince, he trains with Tony Frickland, who some of you guys may remember, you may not. Uh, old school fighter. He used to train out of Militich Fighting Systems. Going back a, a, a long time now. Um, that's his, his head coach. He's got really nice hands, Vince. Very good boxer. Um, we saw him against some Pilate in the Contender Series. He went away, won a fight in Bellator. And he come back, was given your Dong Song. Not a, an easy fight to, to make your official UFC debut with. He gave Song a decent fight. He lost the first couple of rounds, but round three, got out of grapple for the first half of it. But when he got back to his feet, uh, Yudong had slowed down, and um, Vince managed to drag him into a little bit of a brawl. Um, comfortable win over Faraz, Faraz's brother, um, Zahabi. Controlled the fight for three rounds. Zahabi didn't really offer him, shut, offer him anything. Vince shut him down with his hands. And then, as we already mentioned, the Benito Lopez fight. He made a bit of a slow start in that fight, Vince. Uh, Benito is very kick-heavy. Um, he's also got a dangerous flying knee when you close the gap. And I think that made Vince a little bit hesitant to start the fight. He dropped him in round one towards the end of round one. Whether you give the round to Morales. I mean, he was outstruck for, the, for pretty much all of round one. But he did drop at Benito towards the end of round one. And then he started letting his hands go in round two and three. Particularly in round three. Same with Zahabi, really woke up and let his hands go in round three. He's got really nice combinations, really fast hands, really like his boxing. Chris Gutierrez is pretty much a kick-heavy guy, trains at Factory X. He, he's he got very good calf kicks, and as we've seen over the last few years, they're becoming a, a potent weapon, weapon in MMA, and Chris is very good at them, so... And we have seen Vince struggle with kickers. You know, the, the 
Domingo Pilate fight before he had Pilate hurt he was he was kind of struggling with Pilate's length but Pilate was more is more aggressive than Gutierrez Gutierrez is very much a back foot fighter um, and the same with Benito Benito was having success early with his kicks but again he's more of an aggressive fighter and as I said earlier he has that dangerous flying knee when you try and close the gap that I'm sure was in the back of Vince's mind Chris is definitely more back foot than them two and you look at Chris's record, I had a look at like his decision history and he's got a draw in there and then I think five of uh, five of his fights that have gone to a decision have been split decisions. He's not the type of guy to put a stamp on just because of his style. He doesn't really let his hands go, he's really kick heavy. He's got very efficient calf kicks. But the problem is, is if you're not really making noticeable damage and you're not causing the opposition to limp or you're not causing them to switch stances or you're not causing them to flop to the mat from the calf kicks judges will judges prefer face contact unless you're landing real real heavy kicks like someone like a Barboza would they prefer the head punches so here you're gonna have Vince Morales his boxing versus most likely what damage Chris can do with the calf kicks and as good as he is with them it is a bit of a simplistic style that he's got in that sense. Um, he didn't like the pressure either that he was coming under against the Freitas. The Freitas nowhere near as good a boxer as Vince Morrell is. Very wild, kind of running at Chris. But you could see Chris didn't like the pressure that was being exerted on him. He very much likes space. He likes to land those calf kicks. So Vince Morrell was here. He needs to come in. He needs to make a quicker start than he made against... Pilate, um, Yudong Song, look, Yudong Song is just a better fighter, so I'm not really going to uh, hold much against him there. And against uh, Benito, he needs to make a fast start in round one. He needs to close the gap on Gutierrez, and he needs to let his hands go from the start. He's got the better hands here. Um, and I, uh, you know, the odds are Morales is the underdog. He was a bigger underdog earlier in the week, but he's still an underdog. He's like plus 105. I think he should be the favourite. Now, me as a better, I've bet Vince twice and he's let me down twice. So it, it does give me pause, but he won that Benito fight. I don't know, I really know how the judges gave that to Benito. And the Pilate fight, you know, shit happens. He got he got taken down, he got subbed. He's not going to get taken down by Chris Gutierrez. And Vince has got power, you know. He, he stumbled Benito a few times. He dropped Pilate. Um... He's a he's a good solid fighter. He's got good hands, and I just think his hands are going to outweigh Gutierrez's calf kicks here because Chris has just got that kind. Of, I just don't like his style. I I don't think he's going to be in the UFC for too long unless he gets really fortunate matchmaking. I I just don't see enough from him. Um, I mean he beat up Ryan McDonald, but. Ryan McDonald is not a UFC calibre and I mean look what happened the fight after he decision Ryan McDonald and then McDonald gets stopped by Louis Smolka for Christ's sakes with strikes uh, Barcelos fight he got taken down and subbed I mean he, he looked alright on the feet against Barcelos early to be fair to him um, you know he has got good legs but I just I just have to favour the boxing of Morales here unless Gutierrez can really really cause damage to that calf and jeopardise Vince's movement or cause Vince to be switching stances or make Vince very hesitant I have to go with Vince here and I don't agree that with him being the underdog I think he should be the favourite um, fight goes to a decision has been bet right up uh, Vince Morales decision is plus 200 I think that's quite interesting now don't get cute guys if you want to bet Morales put most of your money on the money line don't throw away profit betting Vince Morrell or potential profit betting just Vince Morrell's decision stuff like that's bitten me in the past don't do it you're getting a really good line on the money line as it is so don't get too cute but if you want to sprinkle a little bit on a prop here I think Morrell's decision is is very good value at plus 200 um, he has got power but Gutierrez has never been stopped he's only got the one submission um, in terms of a loss inside the distance. So I think there's value on that decision line for, for Vince Morales there. So I'm going to go with Vince to win the decision here. Um, I think he should be the favourite going into this fight. Next fight, bantamweight as well. This should be an entertaining scrap. We've got Louis Smolker taking on Casey Kenny. Quick look over the stats. Smolker's got a couple of inches in height. 
uh, reaches the same both at 68 inches Casey Kenny is a southpaw fighter strikes only per minute Smolker is up at just over four Kenny's at three and a half strikes absorbed Smolker three and a half Kenny slightly less 3.2 takedowns per 15 minutes um, Smolker's at 1.65 Kenny at 1.4 Take that accuracy for Smolker is 34%, Kenny's 50%, which is pretty good, especially when you look at who he's faced. And take down defense, Smolker down at 30%, Kenny 52%. But again, the Kenny's had a really difficult strength of schedule in the UFC. He's not had it easy at all. Now, I know Louis Smolker really well. I think I am 4 and 0 betting on Louis Smolker fights. Now, I know I bet him against. Richie Vasiluk back in the day and I got lucky there I haven't gone back and watched that fight recently but I remember Smoker was getting that struck in that fight and he hit Sweet Your Music in round 3 um, so I was fortunate to get that W there um, I bet him against Neil Siri. no not Neil Siri. I bet him against Paddy Houlihan in the main event they had I think it was over in Ireland remember I got Smoker around he was a slight favourite I think maybe minus 110 and I've also bet against him a couple of times. I bet Tim Elliott against him. Again, I think that was around evens. And I bet Ray Borg against him. And again, that was around evens. Borg was maybe a slight favourite. So I feel I've got a good read on Smolka. Um, obviously, betting Elliott and Borg, I thought he was going to get out grappled. His takedown defence is not good. As, as I said, 30% takedown defence. He's... I mean, he's made some steps to improve his situation. He now trains with Colin Oyama. Um, he's given up the booze. I know he had a booze problem. Uh, he's fighting at bantamweight now as well, um, which, I mean, he is tall. He's 5'9", five 5'9", nine, five nine man, getting down to 125 pounds. It's not easy. Um, and he's not got the, you know, he's not got the smallest frame in the world. I'm saying he's a big guy, but it's, it's, it's difficult, you know, I've, Man getting down to 125 pounds at five foot nine. That's a it's a big ask. So he has made some steps to improve his situation. He got his return to the UFC uh, when he faced uh, I can't remember the guy's name, Mudajari. I can't remember the guy who looks really good in his second UFC fight when he outstruck Sukantov. Uh, but Smoker came out real grappling heavy approach straight away for the takedown. Just out grappled Sue and managed to get the submission in round two. Then he faced Matt Schnell was really struggling on the feet with Chanel's speed. He, he landed a few decent shots on Chanel, but he was really struggling with the, with the pace on the feet, and he got absolutely grappled up by Chanel. And then he's coming off a win over Ryan McDonald, who shouldn't be in the UFC. So how much has Smolker improved? It is hard, difficult to say, because the first fight, Sue was just well overmatched in the grappling department. Matt Schnell, he, he took a quick loss there, and then he's coming off a win over Brian McDonald, who, as I say, isn't UFC quality. I mean, he's changed his training situation, as I said. He stopped boozing, apparently. But the problem with Smoker is he's, n he's not the most athletic guy. Now, he's very scrambly. He is dangerous in that sense, but he lacks takedown defence. He lacks physicality. His boxing seems like it may have improved, but he, he, he's, he's quite slow. His hands aren't particularly fast. Casey Kenny, we've seen in the UFC three times now. He's had three incredibly difficult fights. He took a very short notice fight against Ray Borg. He got the decision there. A lot of people feel Borg should have should have won that fight, but whatever way you shake it, it was a close competitive fight. And Kenny took it on very short notice. So it was a good performance. Since then we've seen him take on just having a look, I can't remember who he faced in his second fight. Manny Bermudez. Bermudez came in really, I can't remember how much overweight he was in that fight, but he came in real heavy, and you can see when they fight, there's a massive size advantage for Bermudez, but Kenny done really well, I mean, as I say, the size advantage was ridiculous, but he won the first two rounds, and looked like he was going to win the third round, he got Bermudez down, but Bermudez managed to push off the fence and get a reversal, and, and keep on top for the rest of the round, but... It was a solid win for Kenny, taking on a man that came in well overweight, was a lot bigger, a dangerous grappler. Kenny pretty much shut him down on the mat, and then he's coming off a really difficult fight against Marab Divashvali. I, I bet Marab in that fight, I just thought he was going to be too big, too powerful, and 
Kenny made a decent start. It was it was very competitive the first half of the fight, but he started to slow down that insane pace Marab sets, and I'm pretty sure that fight was at a pretty high altitude as well. But Kenny's well rounded. He's a southpaw. He's got some decent striking. We haven't seen a great deal of it in the UFC. The ball fight was pretty much all gra grappling. Manny Bermudez was a grappling heavy fight. Probably the most we've seen of his striking was against Marab, and he landed some good shots on Marab. Marab managed to take all of his shots, but he was catching Marab early with some some good shots. Uh, he's got some good kicks. He's got a good right hook. Uh, he's got a good left hand. So it, the striking is going to be interesting here. I think I give the edge to Kenny in the striking. I think he's just a bit faster, a bit sharper. And I have to give him the edge in the grappling as well. Smolka, as I said, he's he is very scrambly, but his takedown defence is just a bit of a liability. Um, I remember the Paddy, Paddy Hullahan fight even, and I remember Paddy was doing... He, he was very competitive with Smoker on the mat earlier. I know it was a long time ago, but I, I just don't trust Smoker in a, a grappling match unless the guy's completely overmatched, like Sue was when he when he faced him over in, I think it was China. The guy's just, you know, very striking heavy. Just couldn't match him on the ground, but Kenny will. Kenny is a very, very good scrambler. Talking about Smolka being a good scrambler. Kenny's very good. He's not going to take Smolka down, and I don't think he's going to hold him down for a whole round, but I think he's going to do enough to rack up points to win the scrambling, and I give him the edge on the feet as well. So I have to go with Kenny here. There just isn't really any value on the betting line. I mean, minus 275, Kenny is. It's, it's too wide, I mean... Minus 200, I'd probably be tempted, but it's just a bit wide. The over, there's no appeal there, really. Kenny decision, it's a minus as well. It's a pass fight for me. Smoker plus 235. I mean, he might have some moments in the fight, but I mean, I'm not jumping to, to jump on that either. I think Kenny's going to win this fight. So I'm going to go with Kenny, probably probably via decision here. Um, you know, it'd be an entertaining fight though, so I think this is on the fight pass prelims this one. So if you've got fight pass, tune in because the first couple of fights are decent fights actually. Next up on the card, I've got Tim Elliott taking on Brandon Roy Val. I'm it's a hard one to be confident in, especially the current line. Tim's like minus one seventy, minus one eighty. He's a very good scrambler. But he's getting up there in age now. He's 33 years of age. He's coming off a very difficult fight against Askarov where it sounds like he had a, con a bad concussion. You see him round one, he nearly gets knocked out. Nearly, nearly like flops forward. Um, nearly goes out cold, but he, he kind of just seems to wake himself back up. And since he said he doesn't have any recollection of rounds two and three. He's got very good take down. You saw it in the Askarov fight. Askarov was a very good wrestler. He took Askarov down a few times. A really good hip throw. He in round two he managed to keep some top control on Askarov. The thing with Tim is he's very much submission over position. He's not someone that is going to take you down and maintain position. I mean, I remember betting Tim Elliott against Louis Smolker, and I remember he gave me a heart attack numerous times during that fight. He just can't maintain position, but he looks like he's tiring, but he fights through it really well. As I said, his takedowns are really good. He's going to be able to take Roy Val down at, at, at will. Um, on the feet, from watching Roy Val tape, I think his stand-up looked pretty good. You watched the Casey Kenny fight, which was 18 months ago. He was doing all right on the feet with Kenny. I mean, he got dropped. He, Kenny was kind of landing the the more solid shots, but his stand-up looked decent enough to me. His takedown defense was poor, but the thing with the Kenny fight, it was 18 months ago, and since then he's had two fights, and they've one's been over in like 10 seconds. The other one was over in a couple of minutes. It's Joby Sanchez, one of them, who's a UFC veteran. Um, he's a young guy; I think he's about 27. So, what you know, what improvements has he made over these 18 months? You look at his record; though, a lot of the submissions are like triangles and armbar. So that suggests he's often on his back, and that is not a winning formula long term in the UFC. And it's very difficult to submit someone like Tim Elliott off your back. But it's just what does Tim? have left is the question now I wouldn't be shocked if this looked like the De La Rosa fight where Elliot just completely out grapples him but I just think Roy Val's maybe a bit more scrammed in than that albeit Kenny did shut him down on the mat for five rounds I mean Roy Val just got back to his feet now and again but he'd get taken straight back down 
you know, all the signs here point to a Tim Elliott win, but I don't like the price. I'm just not sure where Tim is at. As I say, he's coming off the loss to Figueredo. He's coming off the loss to Askarov. Now, really good competition. He gets 33. He's starting to get up there for a flyweight. So it just makes me reluctant to pull the trigger. But at the same time, I don't really want to be betting Roy Val. I just haven't seen enough process to his game. I haven't seen enough takedown defence. And you know, against a higher level guy like Kenny, he just got shut down. But has he made some improvements? Yeah, it's a tough one. Look, I've probably got to pick Tim here, but I don't like the betting price. It's, I can't bet him at that price. If he was... I don't know, maybe minus 130, minus 140, I'd be tempted. Even then I wouldn't go big, but I'd be tempted. I, I just want to see what Tim's got left. On the feet, I'm not really sure how this fight plays out. Tim's got a very awkward style. I think that's his Twitter tag is awkward MMA. You know, he's very herky-jerky. But historically, you look at, you know, pre prior Tim performances, and I, I definitely lean Tim here, and I can see this being like the De La Rosa fight. But I just don't like him coming off the last couple of performances. He's getting up there in age. You know, it, what improvement has Roy Val made? We just don't know. I've not really seen enough of his game in the 18 months. I'm going to pick Tim, but I'm not, I wouldn't touch the betting line here. Live bet it if you can. But, you know, if Elliot dominates round one, then it's probably going to be what's going to happen for the rest of the fight. But on the feet, I think it's, I can't really get a read on it on the feet, but Roy Val's decent enough on the feet. But I'll pick Elliot, but. It's a pass fight for me from a, a betting perspective. Maybe you have a look at Roy Val decision. I'm not sure what the price is. She feeling funky. I don't think it's out yet, but from a betting angle, it's a pass for me. There's just too many question marks around both of them, and I just don't see value in the line. Next, the men's light heavyweight division. We've got Jamal Hill taking on Clitson Abreu. Quick look over the stats. Hill six foot four. Uh, really good frame for light heavyweight. He's got four inches of height on Abreu. Got five inch reach advantage. He fights out of a southpaw stance versus a brew who they've got a brew listed as orthodox, but in my head I thought he was a southpaw. I'm sure he's a southpaw, unless I'm getting him mixed up with someone else. But I'm sure in the Sam Alvey fight, the right hook wasn't there for Alvey because he was facing the southpaw in a brew. Let me double check. Yeah, Clitson's definitely a, a southpaw. I don't know why it says orthodox at fight metric. Um, uh, the stats are a little bit misleading here because we're only going off one heel fight. You know, eight significant strikes per minute. Absorbs just under three. A brew lands two. Absorbs just under three. And the takedown average, no takedowns from heel. Takedown defense, 53%. Uh, Clitson. Averages 0.67 takedowns per 15 minutes. So, interesting fight here. Hills look good. He looked good on the Contender Series. Comfortable win against overmatched opponent. And then he's coming off the win over Darko Stozic, which... And Stozic isn't ready for the UFC. Um, it was pretty comfortable win for Hill there. He fights long. You know, he's got that long reach. He's a southpaw. He's got a, a good... Uh, body kick from the southpaw stance uses it very well I'd, I'd like to see him I think he's getting a step up in competition here so this is going to answer some questions for me about him he got taken down a lot against Stozic which is a concern Stozic not really any grappling pedigree though he was he was working up to his feet very quickly what I did like from Hill in terms of his get ups is he wasn't giving his back he was using the cage the cage wall didn't give his back up at any points because you can't be doing that against Kids, and that's playing a, a very dangerous game. But Stozic isn't setting traps when you're getting back up. He's not forcing you to give your back up. You know, this is stuff that Clitson is going to do. He's a, a BJJ black belt. He, I think he won a world title at brown belt level. You know, he's a credentialed jiu-jitsu player. He trains out of American top team as well. And he's he's had a difficult strength of schedule in the UFC. His debut was against Ankolaev, you know, real difficult opponent for your debut in the UFC. He had his nose broken early. You can see that affected him because he started decent and then as soon as his nose went, you could see that it kind of took the fight out of him. 
Then he was given Sam Alvey, who, you know, for all the stick we give Sam Alvey, he's he's difficult to look good against. And Clinton did get Alvey down, and Alvey is very difficult to take down, and he he managed to get Alvey's back, and I I can't really recall anyone having any joy of getting Alvey down and taking his back. Alvey did escape, but nonetheless, he did get him down, did get his back, and then he's coming off a fight against a Russian guy that I, I thought, Clitson won that fight. I mean, I remember live betting Clitson, and I wasn't worried at all when it went to a decision. I was really surprised by the decision there. So, this is a chance for him to really show his grappling. His nickname translates to Russian Terror. You know, he's got a submission win over Nemkov. He was raised the hard way. A lot of his career was in Russia, beating Russian guys. So, you know, he's not had an easy path, Clitson. But the game plan here. I mean, this is a difficult one for Hill in the sense that he's facing another southpaw, so that body kick that he likes isn't going to be here. He's going to have to make some adjustments, but if it stays on the feet, I still think Hill wins. I've, you know, he does use his length well and seems to have a solid chin as well. He took some shots off Stozic and it didn't phase him at all. But it's it's how he copes in the grappling phase here if Clitson gets him down and Clitson needs to look for these takedowns more than he has in his other fights. Now, as I said, that it's probably a reflection on the opposition he's had. Ankle Live isn't easy to take down. I remember he got a really deep double on Ankle Live, but he just couldn't finish it. Alvi's very difficult to take down. He, as I said, he got him down and got his back. And then the last guy he fought, he did. I remember he did get a, a take down on him. He's got a nice inside trip from the from the clinch, as Clitson. So there's definitely danger here for Hill if he can't stay on his feet because Clitson is a very good MMA grappler. The line, I think there was value on Clitson. Clitson was up at plus 160, plus 150, plus 140 for a while. The line there is, uh, maybe the value's gone. Hill, still the favourite, minus 130, a brew, plus 110. I'm not kind of chomping at the bit to jump on that now, but I definitely think he was the right play when he was in the one, plus 130 to plus 160 stage. I definitely would would feel there's value there on Clitson because there's a lot of unknowns about Hill. He's had a couple of fights where he's looked really good, but we just haven't really seen him tested yet. And I think Clitson is definitely the toughest test of his MMA career. And we don't know what Hill's ground game's like. How's he going to cope if Clitson gets him down? You know, it could be it could be in quicksand. So I'm still going to pick Clitson here. He's still got a plus number next to his name. He's still the underdog. I think it should be more like a pick 'em, but I, I don't really feel like there's much value now. But I definitely think there was value when he was up, as I said, plus 130 to plus 160 category. Um, decision win. Avery wins inside the distance is plus 300. I don't think that's a bad play because we just don't know what heels like on the mat. He could be in dire straits if this hits the mat, so I don't think that's the worst bet in the world. Heel decision, plus 145, but, you know, he's a small favourite. If you like heel, just take the money line, guys. If you want to bet the decision, just, you know, maybe take a tiny portion of what you're going to put on the money line and put it on decision. But if you like heel, stick with the money line. The price is decent enough, you know, minus 130. He's not a big favourite. But I'm going to pick Clidson here. I'm I'm going to fade heel's grand game, but this is blind because we don't know heel... He got up well against Stozic, but like I said, there's a world of difference between Clitson and Stozic on the ground. Whether he can do the same against a credential BJJ guy who's historically done very well grappling over in Russia and getting submissions in MMA matches against some good opponents, I don't know. So I'll go with Clitson here. Snag a submission. So Clitson for me. Next fight is Billy Quarantello against Spike Carlisle. A real hard fight for me this one because I just can't find tape on Spike. I found Spike's combat fight before when he made his UFC debut, but I can't find it now and I just can't remember the fight at all. Um, I managed to find some uh, clips of his split decision loss, but it's just clips. It's hard to take a full gauge from him and then otherwise you're going off the, the fight where he got the spinning elbow where he was... Just trying to out wrestle the guy, and then he landed the you know low percentage spinning elbow, and then UFC debut again over really quick, landed that head kick. Yeah. 
the thing with Spike is he gives me he gives me Nico Price vibes. Uh, when you look at them two fights, just just feel they're a little bit fluky with how he's ended them. Um, he's a big guy for the weight. He's actually at a catch weight of 150, which favours Spike as well, because I think it's Spike that's probably said that he's going to struggle to make 145 here. He's very thick set. Billy, I like Billy's style. He's This kind of style can go a long way in MMA, even if you're not that skilled, because he sets a terrific pace. He throws a lot of volume. I really like the style, but I just can't get a good enough read on Spike to bet Billy here as a a decent size favourite, you know, you can get him at minus 155 in some spots, but other spots he's still minus 160, minus 170, so I've just, I've just got to pass, because as good as Billy Stahl is in the sense that that pressure game can go a long way in MMA, he, you know, he can be taken down, you, you watch the first round of his fight in the Contender Series, got completely out grappled that first right round, it wasn't until the kid gassed that Billy started to take over, and then, you know, Jacob Kilburn, that guy's not UFC worthy at all. He made Billy look like some grappling phenom. And we know that's not the case because we saw what happened in the first round of his contender series fight. But he's durable. He pushes a high pace. All things that I really like in a fighter. But I just don't have a read on Spike to, to be able to pay the juice. And from what I've seen of Spike and his style... I'm not. I'm, I'm not sure how good his style is beyond one round. It looked like in that fight with a spinning elbow, he was starting to slow down. He went for a real grappling heavy approach. Can he just grapple Billy for three rounds? I don't know. But Billy will push an insane pace. Um, I know he's he's quite pally. I think with Matt Provola, and you know Matt Provola's got that kind of doggy the kind of style and and so they're different styles but, but Biddy has as well so I can't bet Biddy at the current price though because it's I, I'm just too blind on Spike I know some people will still bet in that respect they feel they've got value but I just think it's really hard to determine the value on Spike when I just don't have a full read on his game because there isn't enough footage I would probably risk Biddy if he was closer to evens but it's a live bet fight for me. Let's see if Spike comes out as a good first round. And then if he's looking like he's slowing, I'll, I'll jump on Billy. But it's a pass fight for me. Um, in terms of a pick, I'll, I'll pick Billy because I, I like that pressure style. But please don't place a bet based on my opinion on this fight because Spike is an unknown quantity. And as I said, he gives me Nico Price vibes. So I'll pick I pick Billy, but no confidence whatsoever in that in that particular fight. Next, the last fight on the preliminary card, we've got Antonina Shevchenko taking on Caitlin Chikagan. Um, we've got Caitlin here; she's got an inch reach advantage on Antonina. Caitlin has changed her style a little bit. She isn't as much of an air puncher as she used to be. She has started to sit down on her punches a little bit more. Ever since the Calderwood fight, she's she's just been a bit put a bit more impetus onto her, her strikes. I remember the Barella fight; it was just an awful, awful performance. I bet Caitlin in that fight, and my God, it was just. I mean, I think she won the fight, but it was just absolutely terrible performance. And you know, her fights generally are just not very entertaining, but. She's definitely started to put a bit more into her shots now, and you know I think they've instilled that into her now that she's got to sit down on her on her strikes a bit more and land with a bit more weight. But this fight is in an empty arena, and you're going to have Caitlin Chikagan giving out her her air grunting, and you're going to have Valentina in Antonina's corner giving out the hey yeah hey yeah. Every time she lands a knee in the clinch, it's going to be really, really annoying hearing that on the TV screen. Um, so, I mean, Caitlin, it says on Fight Metric she's never attempted a takedown in the UFC, but that, that, that's not true. She has. Um, there has been fights where she's shot, but she's just not a physical girl. She hasn't got very much physicality at all. You could say, I think it was in her, um, not Jessica I, in the fight she had with the Brazilian, um, the fight before she fought Valentina for the title, she shoots at one point in that fight and just like just bounces off her basically, she's just got 
lacks physicality. So we know where Antonina's weakness is and it's on the ground. I just can't see, unless she slips on a kick and Caitlin jumps on top of her, I just can't see this fight touching the mat. I think it is going to be a stand-up fight. And Caitlin, she's, you know, she's been very successful with her stand-up in MMA. She's, you know, she generally hasn't lost many fights in the UFC. She normally seems to get the decisions. But Antonina is a very decorated striker. And she's looked pretty solid to me in the UFC, Antonina. I know we've got the Roxy fight, but she got out grapple, styles make fights. On the feet, she was lighting Roxy up, you know, easily. Her UFC debut against Kim... I thought she looked decent in that fight. She landed, she fights out of a southpaw stance. She, She's not a heavy hitter. You look at her kickboxing record. I think she's got 39 wins and only 6 KOs. Seen in the UFC when you watch pre-UFC fights. She's not hurting fighters. But when she lands, she definitely lands with a bit more impact than someone like uh, Chikagan. And that kind of stuff registers with the judges. You know, if you're landing impactful strikes, even if the, your volume isn't quite matching the other person, that impactfulness, you know, the eye-catching shots, they tend to hold more sway with the judges. And I don't think Chikagan's going to particularly out-volume uh, Antonina here, but I can just see Antonina's shots just landing with a bit more impetus and that holding sway with the judges. And, you know, I think this is going to be a kickboxing match. I know it's MMA, but I just don't see the grappling threat from Chikagan because I just don't think she can get the fight to the floor. I know she's a... Brand belt under Henzo Gracie. I know she's competed in apparently over a hundred jiu jitsu matches. I'm sure she's a very good grappler, but we just haven't seen it in in MMA. She just can't get fights to the floor. She just lacks the physicality. And Antonina as well is very good in the clinch here. She's very good from the plum. She's got very good knees. You know she's got a, a lifetime of experience in striking. So. Even though this is MMA, I think this is going to be a kickboxing match and Chikagan's going to have to act kickbox uh, a Shevchenko. Now, I know Antonina isn't as good as Valentina, especially in MMA, but I just think her st that she's southpaw for starters. I don't know how many southpaws Caitlin's actually fought. I'm sure I looked through Caitlin's record and I'm sure Valentina was the first southpaw she's faced in the UFC and, and Caitlin's had a lot of UFC fights. So there's that thrown in here. You've got the the more impactful strikes that are going to land, I feel, from Shevchenko. She's got the good clinch work. So I am leaning Shevchenko here. I don't love the price, though, because it's a Caitlin Chikagan fight. You can just see it being a close fight. And I don't know whether judges like that air grunting. It seems to sway them or what. But then you have gonna, you're going to have Valentina in the corner with her grunting for Antonina. So, I like Antonina here, but I would like the price to come down a little bit. I, I honestly have no clue what way the line's going to go. She's minus 150 at the moment. I don't know if I want to pull the trigger at minus 150. I've held off. I'm, I'd like to see a drop. It wouldn't be a big bet, but I would like to see a drop in the price. Um, decision, though, for Shevchenko is... Just having a look, Shevchenko by decision is plus 110. I've, you know, I think that's where the value lies on this fight. I just don't see a stoppage in a million years. Now, as I always say, don't commit fully to the prop. If you like Antonina, she's minus 150. I think it's maybe a little bit wide, but... You just never know in in MMA what what can happen. You know, she might land a head kick or something. Who knows that body kick? Who knows it might it might fail. Chikagan, you just got to be careful getting too cute. But I think it, the value lies in the decision price here for me personally on Shevchenko at plus one ten. I don't think that's a bad price. Um, it's zero point six cheaper than the money line. Which, you know, I think it should be closer. I think the decision line should be more like, bear in mind that the money line's minus 150. I think Shevchenko decision should probably be minus 120, minus 125. So I think there's a little bit of value there. But in terms of the money line, I'm going to wait and see if some Chikagan money comes in. But I just don't know. The Shevchenko name holds a lot of weight. 
I don't know what way the line's going to go, but I like the decision line there personally. Uh, and I'm going to pick I'm going to pick Antonina, but I think it's going to be a close fight. Moving to the main card next, we've got Hannah Cyphers taking on Mackenzie Dern. Look, I mean, from a from a money line perspective, it's unplayable. Mackenzie's up at minus four thirty. She's one of the most decorated grapplers we've had in women's MMA. She's very, very good on the mat. One takedown. This fight is likely over. I mean, Hannah Cyphers is coming off a ground and pound stoppage to Angela Hill. Before that, she got pounded out by Macy Barber. But Mackenzie Dern isn't the best at getting fights to the mat. Her uh, takedown percentage is very low. She hasn't had a great deal of success with her takedowns. She can whack though, Dern. She's got a bit of power in that right hand. Um, so Cyphers has got to be careful there. I mean, she dropped Amanda Cooper. And I remember watching some other fights of hers before the UFC. And she, she, she can certainly whack Dern. But she holds a huge advantage on the mat here. Um... Cyphers isn't particularly big for the weight. It's going to be interesting to see if Mackenzie makes weight. I mean, she did coming back from bizarrely coming back from pregnancy, made the weight easily against Amanda Rebas, but that was a you know a tough fight. Rebas kind of lived up to the hype there. But if she can't get this fight to the floor, then it could get interesting because Hannah's not a bad striker, but I just think she gets this fight to the floor. Now be careful with this one guys, if you are betting the procs, I know there's going to be a lot of people on Mackenzie Dern inside the distance here. Um, so Dern inside the distance is minus 145, I don't think Dern's submission is out yet. But just be careful because Cyphers has been finished by ground and pan twice, I mean it does seem unlikely. I think Dern will snag the submission if she gets her down, but if there's if there's little difference between submission and inside the distance, just pay a little bit extra and take the inside the distance I've been burned on stuff like that in the past you know and unless there's a big difference I can't see there being a massive difference Dern inside the distance is minus 145 I would line Dern submission at probably minus 125 in view of the inside the distance line so just take the inside the distance line for the extra 0.2 points. I'm speculating there, but I mean, if Dern sub, uh, submission comes in at kind of plus 100, and, you know, you're getting a plus number on it, then I'd be tempted just to risk it. But I don't think it will. I think you're looking at a minus probably 120, 125 territory. So so be careful with that one. The over unders out as well. That's been set at 1.5, which. Women's MMA overs, I mean, it's minus 165, so I think if you look historically at the women's, because I've looked at this before, and the overs, when women's MMA is set at 1.5, and the the over tends to hit a lot, I mean, for expecting women to go out and finish really quick, but it's just how quickly does Dern get a takedown there. Her takedowns aren't the best. I mean, if anyone's seen the Yoda fight, she pulled it out of her ass in the last couple of minutes in round three when she finally got a takedown. Um, but she is that good on the ground, Dern, that she can take you down. And she could sub someone like Cyphers really quickly because at least Yoda's a competent grappler, whereas Cyphers, Cyphers isn't. I think she's just in a huge world of trouble as soon as that fight hits the mat. So it could be a long one and a uh, seven and a half minutes if you're if you plan that. I'm just going to look at the odds for it. So it's minus one six five. So it's decimals one point six one. So it's saying that it's going to go over according to the odds sixty two percent of the time. Would this fight, if they fought 10 times, would this fight go over basically at least 6 times? I don't know, the odds seem pretty solid there to be honest. I probably would like it a little bit cheaper. But I'm definitely interested in, in Dern inside the distance. Because I just think that... She gets her down. I just think Cyphers is in a lot of trouble. But you just can't look at the money line. It's either the over or the under, if you like the under, or Dern inside the distance. I'm personally on that fight, but I'm picking Dern there. 
Uh, we've got Roosevelt Roberts taking on Brock Weaver. We've got Roberts at a minus 320 favourite, which is a bit too wide. I think there's a bit of a reflection here on Weaver's UFC debut where he he, he didn't look great, did he, against the... Um, was it the Argentinian guy he fought? He just got out grappled for the whole of the first round and he got the DQ win towards the end of round one. But kind of getting taken down by that guy, held down, all the round one, couldn't get back to his feet. I mean, I didn't, I couldn't make any sense of the performance because he's fighting a contender series. He fought a solid wrestler, big guy at welterweight and he was getting back to his feet. He was he was doing well in the clinches. He wore the guy down and, and just outworked him. And he, you know, it was a decent-ish performance from him. Uh, you see him as well when I think it was on Island Fights, he fought a guy that had been on the Contender Series and real aggressive, he fights out of that southpaw stance. He's got decent boxing as Weaver, uh, really aggressive, just just pressured him, just sunk him basically with pressure and he's got decent combinations, decent boxing. He mixed in takedowns as well. I actually found the Charles Bennett fight. I've, I've looked for that in the past and couldn't find it. And I found it because he's got this split decision win over Charles Bennett, which obviously a split decision win over Charles Bennett is not a good look. And it wasn't the best performance, don't get me wrong, but there's no way it was a split decision. It was... I mean, it's difficult for me to judge fights when I'm capping because I'm I'm not I'm not judging a fight. I'm just looking at one particular fighter. But it, it looked like a pretty clear 30-27 or 29-28 at very worst for Weaver. The split decision was scandalous. So that isn't as bad as it actually looks. Um, he's got the same reach as Roberts here. He's slightly smaller. And as I said, he does fight out that, that southpaw stance. But it it's just hard to really get a proper read on, on Weaver because that, that UFC performance, the UFC debut performance wasn't good. You know, the Charles Bennett performance wasn't great either. He should have been, you know, should have been putting someone like that away in the first round, really. I mean, it's Charles Bennett, come on. But against the guy who fought in the Contender Series, it, it looked better in that fight. As I said, really high pressure. Got in his face. Um, solid performance. I liked the kind of style that he brought to the fight. And then on the Contender Series against Devin Smith, a big welterweight, I thought it was a decent enough performance. So, yeah, there is a there is a reaction here to that performance against Vargas where people are seeing him getting held down. But it's kind of irrelevant here because... Well, I say it's irrelevant. Roberts has used takedowns in the UFC. We saw that against Gifford. Um, now, the reason he was using takedowns against Gifford is even though he was boxing him up on the feet, he didn't like Gifford's pressure. Now, we all saw Gifford in his next UFC fight where he took that massive beat down against Mike Davis so Gifford is one of these guys that's really really tough um, he just keeps moving forward and you could see Roberts didn't like it he couldn't keep him off of him he kept moving forward and that's what was causing Roberts to needlessly engage in the grappling and I mean he was comfortable he was taking him down but he was just putting himself in a little bit of danger with Gifford's long limbs and his submission attempts and so forth he didn't really need to do it but this comes from the inexperience that um, Roberts has he's not sure if it's his third year currently or maybe he's gone into the fourth year now but he's not been training for that long it's three or four years um, he's a, you know he's relatively new to MMA and you can see he does have a high ceiling I feel because he's got very nice boxing very nice straight punches um, he can grapple we saw that against Gifford was taking Gifford down um, we saw him against Yakovlev in his last fight, stuff Yakovlev, Yakovlev in the third round, get mount, finish the fight very strongly. Uh, he's only 26 years of age, so he is improving. But the the big problem Roberts has is he's so linear if he's pressured. Backs up in a straight line horribly all the time, will back up into the fence. And that was where he was giving Yakovlev openings with regards to getting in the clinch and, and hitting some takedowns. Uh, we saw it in the Vince Pichel fight. Which is, he's just so linear with his movement. It's something that he needs to fix ASAP. I mean, the Daryl Halter fight where he locked up the guillotine. He was stuck on the fence. It's a massive problem he has. So my worry for Roberts here is if we if we get the Weaver that I saw on that Island fight against the Contender Series veteran, if you get that Weaver coming in and Weaver takes the shots and keeps pressure in, you know, is he going to ultimately force Roberts to start shooting like he did against Gifford? Now, 
there's no guarantee that Roberts can't just take Weaver down and out grapple him. You know, there's a strong chance he probably can. Um, but I think Weaver is going to make Roberts feel a little bit uncomfortable in there at times. I think he is going to pressure him, which will result in Roberts backing up to the fence and Roberts ultimately trying to alleviate the pressure by shooting for take land. So I think the line is too wide here. I I did. I've been fortunate with. I mean, Bet Online's the only site I can use of at the moment, as I've mentioned a few times, and they've been opening a lot of the fights. And I took pre-tape Roberts at minus 200. Um, I just threw, I think, 800 on him. I managed to get down to to profit 400. I'm not sure if I'm going to let that ride or not. I don't know if I'm going to buy out or not because he does struggle with pressure. And you know, I'm ignoring Weaver's debut here, but because he just didn't see you striking, but he did get taken down and held down by by the guy who fought Vargas, and so if he can do that, and, and you know, Roberts probably can. And Roberts does have very good boxing. I think he is going to ping Weaver, who's going to be trying to come in, but, you know, he's got that Hawaiian toughness as Weaver. Whether he can put Weaver away, I, I don't know. We haven't seen him put anyone away in the UFC um, with strikes yet, but... Weaver has to be careful as well, though, if he's going to mix in his game, because he will go for takedowns, Weaver, and we've seen that Roberts has got very good guillotine choke. Uh, we saw him catch it on Hawkshaw. He almost caught it on Yakovlev. But Yakovlev allowed him generally to dictate the the octagon in there. Um, and Vince Pichot, he had a very good first round against Vince, but then Vince kind of woke up and got his grappling going. Like Weaver's not got that kind of wrestling progress I don't think I, I I don't know if he can I mean Gifford even took Roberts down so Roberts is a work in progress and that footwork is definitely something he needs to work on because he's so linear but yeah the line's wide I wouldn't bet Roberts at minus 300 as I said I've I've got Roberts at minus 200 and I may buy out I may buy out um, so I think at the current line, I'm going to pick Weaver just based on the line. Remember, I don't, you know, give me even odds here and I take Roberts, but I'm picking based on value here and the line's too wide. I mean, Weaver's plus 260 at five dimes. Roberts shouldn't be that big of a favourite. This is a reflection on his on his UFC debut and while there is a potential Roberts could do the same thing as Vargas done, I think we are going to see this fight play out more on the feet because Roberts does prefer to strike um, but he will go to the grappling based on the Gifford fight to alleviate pressure and he's going to get pressured here so this 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 could get interesting so for me I'm going to pick Weaver just based on the value on the line um, but as I say I mean it's not a confident pick because I, I do lean Weaver uh, sorry Roberts here but the line's just too wide so I'll pick Weaver but it, I definitely wouldn't go big on that keep it small if you want to take a punt on Weaver um, next, we've got Kevin Holland taking on Daniel Rodriguez. So, as you all know, if you listen to the pods, I was on Hernandez against Holland. <laughs> Flopped horribly. Holland won in like 30 seconds. Holland's fighting two weeks later. He's moving down to welterweight. I think it's the right move for him. He's not a big middleweight. He weighed in against Hernandez at 182 pounds. So, he's you know, he didn't even cut any weight and... If if he's walking around at 182 pounds, he's, he's just got to shift 12 pounds here. So I think it's a good move for him because he is a bit undersized at middleweight. But you know, the other side of the coin is is he going to be losing uh, some of that speed and so forth that he carries at middleweight? But it's a difficult division to contend at if you haven't got the physicality. So I think this is a good move for him. You know, most people wouldn't move down in weight. It generally doesn't work out. It seems to be people moving up that have more success, but I I think this is a good move for for Holland. He's fought at welterweight in the past. It's it's been a long time. He's obviously a bit older. I I think it's maybe three or four years since he last fought at welterweight, so his his frame's probably filled out a little bit. So as long as the cut's okay for him, which it should be, you know, walking around at 182 pounds for the Hernandez fight, I think he's fine here. And as I said on the last podcast, Kevin Holland is someone that's he's very comfortable in that. Octagon. I did say whether he chats a lot before to kind of ease the the pressure on him in there and to make him feel relaxed in there. But you can see he's real relaxed in there. Um, he's taken on Daniel Rodriguez. We saw him on the Contender Series get a decision win over someone with a quite a similar frame to to Kevin Holland. 
Uh, guy really rangy, had a big reach advantage. Holland's got a seven inch reach advantage here over Rodriguez. And then Rodriguez is coming off a, a solid win over Tim Means. Uh, clipped Tim Means right at the end of the first round, behind the ear. Her, Means just never recovered. Um, he came out, landed a few more shots in the second round that you could see they were hurting Means. False Means to shoot, and he, he locked up a guillotine and got the submission. So, I think there's a clear path to victory here for Kevin Holland. Um, now, as a, as you know, I faded him against Hernandez, but I thought Hernandez's style would pose problems for Holland. And well, I mean, we never really got to see that play out. He caught Hernandez really early to the body, but although the fight only lasted 30 seconds, I did like what I saw from Holland in that 30 seconds because he came out, he fought long. There was one point where Hernandez tried to pressure him, and he circled out away from the cage. I liked that. Um, and you, you know, you even when you watch Holland's other fights, you can see, he's for, you know, even against someone like John Phillips, who, and I've spoken about John Phillips on the podcast before. I know him from the UK scene. This guy cracks hard. It's one of the hardest hitters you've ever come across. And in round two against Phillips, I mean, it was it was stupid fight IQ from Kevin Holland just sitting on the fence. But I mean, he was rolling really well with shots, and Phillips got through. Uh, through with a few and man he just ate them and then you see he fights Thiago Santos as well he takes Santos the distance he took a round of Santos he seems really durable really durable he's just it's just that fight IQ and that structure to his game that he needs to work on but you watch that first round against Phillips who is a southpaw like Rodriguez and he came out firing that teep kick to the body of Phillips and he hurt Phillips to the body multiple times in the first round I, I don't see why that isn't a huge weapon for him here against Rodriguez, who, like Phillips, looks a little bit soft around the body. And we did see Rodriguez get hurt here on the contender series to the body. Farrington threw a, a straight punch to to the body and really hurt him. It forced Rodriguez to go in for a takedown and to take Farrington down. So if Holland fights smart here without being dumb, uses his length... I think he could mix his grappling in as well. He's very dangerous with them long, skinny arms with chokes and so forth. I think this is his fight to lose against Rodriguez. Um, I think Rodriguez is going to, as long as Holland, as I keep saying, fights smart, which is a big if. He's going to struggle with the range. You saw on the Contender Series fight now, he's a southpaw. He used the low kick well against Farrington, but he was really struggling to get... He was throwing like an overhand left to try and close the distance. And I just... I just can't see that working against Holland. Now, against Means, Means, you know, he's a, a pocket boxer. He likes to fight close. I think there was an inch difference in the reach between the two. So he was there to be caught by Rodriguez. But Holland, as long as he fights long, he's, he should throw that tape a lot. I think he can hurt Rodriguez to the body. I think his length will give Rodriguez kittens here. And as I say, I think if he gets on top, I think he can give Rodriguez all sorts of problems. Um, but I don't really have a full read on Rodriguez's ground game, but seems to come from a striking background. I know he had uh, Joel Schilling in his corner, and I know he's done some work with Cowboy. So, and looking at his fights, from from what you can find, you know, he seems to be a striker. So, I think this is Holland's fight to lose. He's currently sitting at minus 210 on five dimes. Uh, everywhere else he's anything from minus 225 to minus 250. I don't know where the line's going to go. Perhaps Rodriguez is going to get some money. Um, but and honestly, I'm very confident in Holland here. I know it sounds a strange thing to say, especially when you listen to the podcast I've done the other week and I picked Hernandez. I actually had a unit on Hernandez. But styles make fights, guys, ultimately. This is, this is what we are looking at, styles. And Hernandez... I still think if he doesn't get taken out to the body, it's an interesting stylistic fight against Holland. Um, would I bet Hernandez again? I don't know because um, he's definitely soft to the body because he's been hurt there before and straight away Holland. And whether Holland spotted that and that's something he identified, then I mean that's smart fight IQ if he did. And he should be noting this against Rodriguez in that fight that he had on the contender series and adopt that strategy used against John Phillips. And we know he can fight long. He fought long against Chirico in round three when he had the, the hurt shoulder. And he won the round. It was the clearest round of the fight. It's just, it's just, you know, it, it's just, is he going to be a bloody clown out there? That's the problem with trusting him. So, I mean, I I don't mind the price now, but you just have to factor in that trust factor with Holland. So, 
but I think anything that comes under minus 200, I mean, <laughs> I think it's a very good fight for Holland, unless the weight cut really s uh, takes the life out of him and his chin goes, but even then, I think if he fights smart, Rodriguez is going to have a hard time getting to him, so... I like Holland here. I'm picking. I'm picking Kevin Holland to win this fight, get back-to-back -back wins in the space of a couple of weeks, and to look good down at welterweight. So, Kevin Holland for me. Heavyweight next co-main event. We've got Augusto Sakai taking on Blagoje Ivanov. Oh, I've got no idea who's going to win this. In all honesty, I've done some tape on it. I, I pre-tape. I thought I'm, I'm not going to have a clue. I've done tape. I've, I've got no lean. It's basically a pick 'em fight with a lion. I think that's accurate. I've, 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 I don't know who's going to win. I don't know. Um, Ivanov is incredibly tough. He's the guy that was. I think he was stabbed in the heart in the bar fight. And I mean, you watch his fights and like the Derek Lewis fight. He's just taking the shots off of Derek Lewis. The guy's incredibly tough. I don't think he's ever been KO'd in an MMA fight. Real tough guy. Augusto Sakai. Brazilian fighter. Seen him a few times in the UFC now. He's coming off a quick KO win. This is going to be a striking fight, guys. They're going to be on the feet for three rounds. Um, Ivanov, incredibly hard to put away. Sakai, I don't think has ever been put away either. I think everyone was probably waiting for the over on this fight. It's come out. It's currently sitting at minus 175. So, you know, that's implying that the fight goes to decision. I think it's just over 6 out of 10 times. To be honest, I capped it 7 times out of 10. I think this fight sees a decision. But, even though I've capped it at that in my head, it still feels a little bit weird parting with money on a heavyweight fight going over 2.5 rounds at, at minus 175 it doesn't feel right even though I think there's a bit of value in the odds you know it is heavyweight MMA they're four ounce gloves it just takes one shot it just makes me you know I would have much preferred a, a, a cheaper price even though I, as I say I, I cap it higher it's just a weird one to part money on um, at minus 175. Sakai is coming off the quick win over Tabora. Knocked him out inside a minute. Before that, split decision win over Olofsky, a fight that I thought Olofsky won. And before that, he got the third round stoppage against Chase Sherman. I remember betting uh, Czech Congo against Sakai. That's his only loss. That was over in Bellator. Congo basically fence-hugged him for three rounds. He... I think he might have got a couple of takedowns, but Sakai was straight back to his feet every time. And Ivanov's going to be happy to come in here and brawl. Um, he got the win over Ben Rothwell. I thought he lost that fight to, to Ben Rothwell. I uh, thought Rothwell deserved that decision. I don't think the Derek Lewis fight was a split decision. I thought that was a pretty clear win for Derek Lewis. So he, something about Ivanov that the judges seem to like. But I do see this going to a decision. It's just I haven't made up in my mind if I want to bet minus 175 on a heavyweight fight going over two and a half rounds because it it just sounds like a steep price in my head. And I know I'm not making any sense here, even though I capped it at more like kind of minus 200. But it just feels weird parting with money. So I haven't made my mind up on that one yet. But I do, as I said, I do just see this fight going to a decision more often than not. Who am I going to pick? I've got no lean here, so I've just got to go with the underdog. And Levanov's the underdog at the moment. Although it has, it's actually a pick -em at most books now. He was the underdog. I definitely would have picked him as the underdog. I mean, I normally go off five times odds when I'm, when I'm doing this podcast. He's the underdog there, minus 105. It's not a plus number though, but... I'll pick the I'll pick the underdog of Arnold, but for me, if I'm to make a play on this fight, it will be the over. But whether I play it or not, I th I don't know. It's just you know it's going to be an awful twelve and a half minute sweat, and you know it is a bit of juice you're paying on a heavyweight over there, which just doesn't feel right. Main event: we've got Gilbert Burns taking on Tyrone Woodley. Woodley's currently at minus 190, Gilbert Burns plus 165. I think the last four UFC events, I haven't looked beyond the last four, so it might be a, a longer run. I can't remember what the main event was before the Oliveira fight, but I think the last four underdogs have won on 
on UFC main events. And we've got Gilbert Burns here. Now, my initial lean was uh, Woodley, but there's no way I'm betting Woodley as a minus 185 favourite. He's coming off, I think he's coming off shoulder surgery here. He's 38 years of age now. He's not fought for over a year. Now, he's an extremely athletic guy, so he's not your average 38-year-old. Um, now, age plays a factor at world of weight. It's a lighter weight class. So, you know, he is he's getting up there in age for an older guy. I've read some rumours that he, he needs money. He's come back for the paycheck. You know, I, I, I don't read too much into that stuff from a capping perspective because I'm, you know, I like to just take what I know and that's from tape basically and fighting ability but just her, hearing this stuff as well it doesn't um doesn't sound great but I, I do disregard it when I start cap, when I cap a fight basically pretty much unless it's an extreme kind of uh event but he's been out for over a year the Darren Till fight now was what we're getting on for 18 months ago that was the problem with Woodley is just his style you know he'll back up He's got incredible power. Doesn't use his wrestling because he's worried about slowing down. He's not going to use his wrestling here, I don't think, against Gilbert Burns. And <sighs> is he going to land the kill shot on Gilbert Burns or is Burns? And Burns has improved a lot. You know, his striking's a lot better than it was. Is Burns going to at, at volume him? Because he's not going to be able to take Tyron Woodley down. It's going to be a stand-up fight. We've seen Burns knocked out. You know, Hooker knocked him out down at lightweight. And Woodley, you know, yeah, he's dro he drops most. He dropped Darren Till, you know, he dropped Wonder Boy in both fights. He's got incredible power in that, in that left hand of his. But his style is just, it's just, I can't bet him as a big favourite because of his style. He's so low volume, you know, he skirts the fence. I just can't bet. I just can't bet him. I can't bring myself to bet Woodley. And then the the long layoff, 38 years of age, surgery. I think the value is on Gilbert Burns. Now I'm not confident here with Burns because I can just I just see Burns eating a kill shot at some point in this fight. That's what I see in my head. I just because five rounds is a long time. You know, and you look at people like Wonder Boy, a, a great striker, really good reflexes, very good defensively. He's, he got caught in both fights still. You know, Darren Teal, caught Darren Teal. You know, and Burns is going to have to be aggressive here. He's going to have to let his shots go to that point, would Lee. And, and I just, in five rounds, I just see him getting caught at some point. That's the, that's the predicament we've got here. But, as I say, this is a betting podcast I have to go with a value and I haven't bet this fight but if you put a gun to my head and said I have to make a play I can't bet Woodley at minus 185 I can't do it I, I, so I'm going to pick Burns although I'm not confident and I mean Burns realistically probably needs a, he needs to win a decision I just can't see him, see him stopping Woodley and Woodley could knock him out. I mean, Woodley could nick a decision. That you know, it's not beyond the realm of possibility. Woodley could nick a decision here on you know if he drops Burns a few times. You know, um, you know he could win two rounds from just dropping, dropping Gilbert Burns. That literally could happen. Um, could hit a few counter shots. You know, he he could snag a decision here. Woodley he could knock him out. And Burns, I I can only see him winning the decision. What is the price on that? What's the over? The over's at four and a half rounds, so no thank you. Uh, Burns wins by decision plus four four five. I don't think that's bad. I don't think that's bad. I don't see him. I just can't see him stopping Woodley. I don't see it. You know, Woodley's coming off that performance against Usman where he didn't look great, dominated, but no, Usman's a beast, man. Completely different style to Burns as well. What's Woodley inside the distance? Plus one sixty. I I just I hate betting Woodley fights. I bet um, Wonder Boy against Woodley. I think it was the first time. I thought I had it in the bag, and then he drops him. 
He's just so dangerous. He's got so much power. And you overcommit and he catches you, puts you down. Just hate betting his fights because at the same time I just unless I feel he's gonna go out and absolutely dominate someone which he rarely does and he doesn't use his resting, I just you know, he's got really good leg kicks as well, Woodley. I wonder if he brings them out here. He's got really powerful leg kicks. But I just have difficulty trusting him to bet, especially as a favourite. So I'm going to pick I'm going to pick Burns because he's plus 160. I'm not confident. A Woodley kill shot. You know, again, you give me even money here or even even plus 1 uh minus 1 120 minus 130. I'll probably take Woodley. But the fact he's at plus 160. Oh, no, I'm not. I'm picking Woodley. I don't like the price, but I just can't bet Burns either. I can't bet Burns. I just think he gets caught. I think he gets caught at some point. But there's a lot of question marks here with Woodley. Motivation at 15 months. Shoulder surgery. 38 years of age. This is a tough, real tough fight for me to call. Uh, but I'm going to go Woodley. I just think he's going to. I think he's going to nail him at some point. I think he's going to nail him and put him down. Um, Woodley inside the distance plus 160. I wonder what the KO line will be. Plus 200 maybe. Might be worth a play. It's not a fight I'm going big on either way. Maybe I'll I'll take a stab on Woodley KO if it's plus 200, perhaps. But it's just I just don't have a strong lean on this. I think Tyrone Woodley fights are in, incredibly hard to cap, unless he's facing someone like Usman or he's got a striker who's got a, you know really solid chin. But even then that. That detonation when Woodley lets go is big, but he's getting up there in age. So I'm I'm going to pick Woodley, begrudgingly. I wouldn't be surprised if Burns pulls this off. I don't fault anyone betting Burns, but I just see him getting caught at some point. So I'm going to go with Woodley here, but I don't think there's any value on his money line. I might take a stab at KO, or I might just live bet the fight. Um, it's definitely not a fight that I'm overly interested in betting. So that wraps up the card, guys. We've gone through all the card there. A um, few spots that are decent, I feel, in this card. But I don't love this card for betting. We'll be back next week for UFC 250. As I said at the start, 25% discount running on memberships at the moment. It's only £150 for access to the pre-bets and to live betting for the next 12 months we're going to have approximately 100 shows where we're going to be pre-betting or live betting there's lots and lots to go at so 150 pounds you can't access that through the website pro betting.com you need to either email me info at pro betting.com or send me a dm on twitter at pro betting haven't got a great deal of pre-action on this card but UFC 250 is definitely looking busier for me and of course we're going to have live betting for this event and as I've said there's loads of books that are offering live betting at the moment and it's such a great way of making easy money. As I said all bets are tracked, the free trackers are linked below this video and you can also access them from the website ProMMABetting.com. Good luck with your bets guys, hope we all make some money and we'll be back in a week's time.